Welcome. I'm Rex Lamore. I'm the director of the Michigan State University Center for Community and Economic Development and a member of the Michigan State University Working Group for Circular Economy. And for the past several months, several faculty here at Michigan State University have been working to support scholarly research, outreach, and education in the complex field of circular economy. And so I'm pleased to welcome you to one of our forums focusing on the scholarly activity of one of our colleagues who's also advancing the work of circular economy. For those of you who may not be familiar with this term, a circular economy seeks to reduce and ultimately eliminate waste and, tra and transition our society from a linear production consumption model to a ta of take make waste to a production consumption model that focuses on designing out waste and maximizing the reuse of materials over and over again. And this transition to a circular economy is transformative and calls upon all of our scholarly capacity to conduct research, training and outreach in a variety of fields of study. And we have placed in our chat room for you today links to past forums and videos, and we encourage you to view the, the work of your colleagues and the work that they have been doing in advancing elements of circularity. Joining us today is Sebastian LaRue, who graduated in 2010 in the Architectural Engineering Program in Brussels, Belgium. And after his graduation, he worked in building services as an engineer and sustainable construction consultant he started a PhD program in 2021 and has been working with a colleague of ours, Daniel Cooper at the University of Michigan, particularly examining the potential for reuse and recycling uh, HVAC systems, heating, cooling systems. There's an increasing number of European cities that are promoting reuse as a key strategy and a transition to a more circular economy in the construction sector. And we're excited to have uh, Mr. LaRue here with us today to share with us the scholarship that he's advancing as we look at this very important field of circular economy as it relates to construction materials. And so with that, let me introduce Sebastian LaRue. So good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much uh, for attending my presentation today. And thank you uh, again uh, to the Michigan State University for inviting me to to speak about my research. Um, so today, as uh, Rex uh, said, I will be talking about the reuse of build in building infrastructure and more specifically, uh, the reuse of building services products. Um, further, I'm using the term mechanical, electrical, electrical and plumbing um, uh, products, uh, MEP, uh, which is also known uh, a common name. So here on, on the screen, you can already see um, an example of the reuse of our, an air handling unit in, uh, in the center of Brussels. So my name is Sébastien Leroux. I'm a PhD candidate at the Université Catholique de Louvain in, in Belgium. And my work also gathers two other uh, partners. Uh, there is the University of Michigan with uh, Professor Daniel Cooper and also Synergy, uh, which is a, an, an, an engineering consultancy um, in, uh, in Brussels. And my work is funded by Innoviris, uh, which is um, the Brussels region's public institution for research and innovation. Um, today, I will cover four uh, different points. Uh, the first one is uh, circularity in Europe. Uh, so I have prepared some slides to give you a, an overview of that topic. Then I will be speaking about uh, the reasons why uh, we should reuse building infrastructure. Um, then I will go uh, into, into deep, uh, in two different uh, findings uh, related to my research. And I will describe um, those in detail and also speak about the implications uh, of those findings and some practical application. 
So first of all, the circularity in uh, in Europe uh, is really embedded in the European Green Deal, uh, which was uh, communicated by the European Commission in uh, 2019. And the European Green Deal uh, aims to transform the, the EU's economy for a sustainable future, uh, where there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases in 2050, and where economic growth is decoupled from resource use. Uh, circularity, as you can see here on, on the image, is one of uh, the 10 core objectives uh, of the European Green Deal. Um, so it's about mobili mobilizing uh, industry for a clean and circular economy. That's one of the core objectives. Uh, circularity is formalized in the Circular Economy Action Plan that you can see here on the screen. Uh, it was communicated by the European Commission in uh, 2020, so one year after the European Green Deal. And the main idea uh, behind that plan is to change the way we consume and produce. And here you can see an example uh, where um, it shows that we want to, to change the way we consume and produce the electronics and ICT. So it, it's just an example. But uh, what the document aims is to uh, place uh, that the products placed on the European market will be designed to last longer, to be easier to repair and upgrade, recycle and reuse. Uh, there is also an intention of uh, uh, having new business models, such as products as a service. So here, uh, circularity is further even detailed in the Sustainable Product Initiative. So here, uh, with the image, you can understand better uh, uh, how it works. Um, and then the main goals behind the Sustainable uh, Product Initiative is to support the circular design of all products based on a, a common methodology and principles, to prioritize reducing and reusing materials before recycling them, and to foster new business models, to prevent environmentally harmful products from being placed on the European market, and also to strengthen the extended producer responsibility. So now I'm moving to the second topic. Uh, so the reuse of uh, building products uh, in, the, in the construction fields. Uh, so this is a document that was uh, made by Brussels Environment, uh, so in, in Belgium, where it shows uh, that reuse is a preferred strategy uh, to deliver uh, circularity in the region. So here I have um, I, I'm, I'm showing you um, the way we use is uh, oftenly assessed. Uh, so we often assess uh, reuse in comparison to the replacement. So here you have two life cycles for a product. Um, so the first line shows uh, the, the business as usual, where uh, the product is uh, manufactured, it's used. Uh, and then it goes to end of life, uh, it is uh, landfilled, and then we manufacture a new product and we, we do it again. It's kind of a, um, yeah, like the lin linear economy. And then on the second line, you can see uh, what's happening with a reused product. Um, so it goes into the same steps uh, in the first life cycle, but then for the second life cycle, instead of uh, being rem uh, being uh, uh, landfilled and are manufactured again, uh, we just extend its life uh, to last uh, to last longer. Uh, one of the main advantage uh, of reusing uh, building products is that it can help us reduce our uh, environmental footprint. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there is the, the manufacturing uh, step uh, that is avoided. Uh, and also the, the landfill environmental impact are also avoided. But the reusing building products uh, also provide uh, op um, opportunities for new local jobs. So as you can see here, 
the dismantling of building products is uh, time consuming and uh, meaning that people uh, can work on dismantling those, those products, which is very different to uh, uh, the linear uh, economy where we just demolish the building as quick as possible. And finally, reusing building products also allows us to retain economic value uh, in the products. Um, so here, uh, I have some examples that I can show you, but uh, sometimes we throw uh, products before the end of their uh, economic life. So reusing is also a mean of um, accessing uh, the, full, uh, the full extent of uh, the full potential of our products. I now move on uh, my research. So um, as, as you may know, in, in, in Europe, the reuse of architectural product is, um, is growing. Uh, it becomes more and more common. Here you see some examples um, of the reuse uh, of tiles and doors. Uh, this is really something happening uh, in Europe at the moment. But when it comes to MEP products, like mechanical electrical plumbing products, here you can see a chiller. Um, we start to raise multiple questions. Uh, it doesn't seem so easy to, to reuse. Uh, there are many issues behind it. Um, so here I have listed a series of differences uh, for building services uh, products or MEP products in comparison to architectural products. So for me, there are three main differences. Um, the first one is that uh, MEP products are very variable in complexity. Um, so you have a broad range uh, of products. Uh, as you can see here on the image, you have some linear products which are quite simple, such as pipe, uh, ductworks, uh, electrical cable. And then on the other, at the end of, the, of that range, you have very complex products such as chillers or air handling units. Um, and in between, you can have uh, luminaire, uh, lighting fixtures, or something just this is a medium complexity. Uh, and then another uh, very important point is that uh, MEP products are subject to changing regulations. Uh, for example, uh, if we take uh, the chiller, uh, if, if you see back in, in the time, uh, the energy requirements were much lower than, than what we have now. Uh, there are also uh, many safety issues uh, to some of those products uh, can, can cause. Um, and then the, the last point is that um, MEP products may use a large variety of materials. Um, very often we see um, uh, steel, copper, aluminium, but uh, they, they can also be made out of uh, rare earth materials uh, that are sometimes very critical. So more specifically, my project aims to facilitate the reuse of MEP products uh, and to answer those two questions. The first one is how to quickly assess the condition of a specific MEP product and how to identify the appropriate remedial work to enable it to be reused. And then the second question is how to quickly quantify the environmental, social and financial performance of reusing that specific MEP product. Um, and more specifically, uh, my work focuses on, on five types of MEP products. The, there is the uh, linear pipe, uh, ductwork, ventilation ductwork, electrical cable, lighting fixture, and chiller. Um, so those, uh, those products, oops, sorry, those products uh, were chosen because of their relevance to material flows costs and environmental impacts in building renovation within the region of Brussels. So here is a, is a bit of a detail of how uh, did, did we choose uh, those, those products. Um, so we quantify the material flows, costs and environmental impacts um, using a bottom-up approach for the region of Brussels. Uh, that means that we collected a series of bill of quantities and pre-demolition audits uh, of representative, representative building renovation projects uh, within the region of Brussels. Uh, and then this is the kind of results that, that, that we got uh, from that study. Um, 
So on the left-hand side, uh, we see a series of parameters related to the inflows of MEP products on a yearly basis for the region of Brussels. Uh, for example, um, if, we, if we take the rectangular ductwork, we, we have calculated that there are 32 kilometer of uh, ductwork incoming uh, only the region of Brussels uh, on a yearly basis uh, to, to sustain uh, the renovation of our office buildings. Um, but also that graph uh, shows us that there are other parameters that we should uh, uh, take into account. So for example, the embodied fresh water use uh, related to, to that quantity of rectangular uh, ductwork is about uh, 100,000 uh, uh, cubic meter. Also the embodied uh, energy use, the embodied um, global warming potential, the net purchase price and installation labor hours. So that kind of graph uh, helps us to understand uh, what priority should we give um, in the products uh, to, to reuse uh, in a region. Uh, and then on the right hand side, uh, we can see the difference between the inflows and the outflows for those products. Um, at the scale of the region of Brussels. Uh, so the value of 100% is given to the maximum value for each of those uh, inflows or outflows. But then, for example, if we look at the rectangular ductwork, uh, we see that about 60% uh, of the outflows, um, uh, yeah, that we uh, throw about 60% uh, of what we actually uh, uh, purchase uh, the incoming. So that means that there is a potential uh, to match uh, the demand of the supply uh, by reusing uh, those, uh, those elements. Um, so I, I will now focus on the first research question, uh, which was uh, how to quickly assess the condition and the appropriate remedial work to enable uh, a specific product to be reused, for example, this chiller. So what we've done here is that we uh, we checked all available um, methods to to assess the condition and uh, remedial work for for uh, for building products, uh, and we found a large variety of uh, available methods that are uh, that differ uh, in type of their input requirements, uh, method burdens, and output provided. Um, here we see that um, also the accuracy of outputs varies a lot. So you, you have some methods that give a, a very good, uh, a, a very detailed um, a condition report for for a specific uh, product, but some others are uh, are very uh, more approximative. Um, and then, yeah, maybe I have to describe a bit those methods. So you have, uh, of course, the ASHRAE and CIPC methods that are provided by Engineering Association. Uh, and here I'm, I'm referring to um, like life expectancy uh, tables uh, that are provided uh, by those associations. Uh, and then on the other end, uh, you have um, um, some methods that were developed uh, in the academy. Uh, such as the one of Aniti Asari or Quack uh, that are uh, based on re reliability uh, theory. And then in between, you have uh, other types of methods uh, such as the NAN, uh, which is the a Dutch standard um, that is uh, designed to help uh, people to quickly assess the condition of products. And then you have also some uh, two other methods uh, that were created in Belgium, um, one of Brussels environment and the other one of the CSTC. Um, but uh, it's also interesting to, to know that only uh, one of those methods uh, provide us with a indication of what remedial work uh, should we do uh, to enable that product to be reused. Um, and then also the requirements and burdens uh, varies uh, uh, vary a lot uh, for those methods. So you have some methods where uh, the input requirements are very low. So for example, the ASHRAE method, you only need uh, the number of years that the product uh, has been working. Um, and then with a simple calculation, you, you can find uh, the answer of what is its remaining life. 
Uh, and on the other end of, of that uh, spectrum, you had the CSTC method where it's much more intensive. You, you need someone to go on site to, to do some tests, actual testing on the, on the product. Uh, and then to also, um, check in the literature, uh, changes in regulations and, um, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, you have very different types of methods, and the time uh, the time required uh, to make those methods work is very different. Uh, some of those methods are a bit subjective as well, such as the the Dutch standards. This is a weakness of that method. Um, then yeah, at the end of the day, uh, three methods are uh, seems very promising uh, for 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 to answer the the question I raised earlier. Uh, and maybe a combination of those three methods uh, seems the more appropriate. Uh, here, I'm, I'm going to show you a proposal I, I've done. So I, I created uh, an adaptation of Quack's methods uh, to assess the condition. Uh, so the condition here depends on uh, two metrics. There is the physical reliability. So when does the product uh, is supposed to break? Uh, and the other metric is the technological performance, when this product is supposed to become obsolete. Um, and for that, we use uh, probabilities uh, with exponential depreciation, uh, depreciation function, uh, where each of those uh, formula has a main parameter. So for the, um, for the physical reliability, the main parameter is the um, failure rate. Uh, and then for the technological obsolescence, the main uh, parameter is the rate of successive generation release. Um, and then those parameters can be found in the in the literature. Uh, for example, the failure rate uh, for MEP products was assessed by um, a, a survey by the Department of Army here in the US. Uh, That's a very interesting document. And also for the rate of uh, successive generation release, we can uh, analyze uh, changes in uh, in regulations. For example, changes of energy requirements in uh, in ASHRAE. So here is a, an example uh, the the results that we have for an air cooled chiller. Uh, so there is two axes: the physical reliability and the technological performance. And we can see uh, how uh, products and their components uh, degradate uh, in time. So each line has different uh, dots, and each dot corresponds to uh, uh, a different uh, moment in time. So for example, the triangles show uh, what would be the situation for a specific components after five years of service. Uh, so if we see here at the condenser, we see that um, uh, the way uh, it degradates um, uh, in time is is really like he loses a lot of physical reliability, uh, but he keeps uh, a good technological performance. Uh, that means that after five years or ten years, um, maybe we would need to look at repairing uh, that uh, that component. And uh, on the other end, you you have uh, the compressor, who, uh, which behave uh, very differently. So the physical reliability stays quite high in time, uh, but its its te technological performance uh, drop uh, quickly quicker. So meaning that after ten years, maybe we should look at upgrading uh, the the compressor. I'm now moving on uh, on the second uh, question, uh, how to quantify uh, the environmental, social, and financial performance of reusing a specific product. And more specifically, I will talk about uh, social aspects uh, that I think are, are quite um, innovative uh, in the field. So uh, uh, we propose to use the social life cycle assessment methodology, uh, which was uh, published by the uh, United Nations Environment, Environment Program. Um, and that uh, the social life cycle assessment methodology is a methodology to assess the social impacts of products and services along their life cycle. It's uh, currently the most effective assessment method for social sustainability of products and organization. 
it's it is relatively new uh, the first guidance document was published in 2009 uh, by the united nations environment program and it provides information for policymakers and companies and clarifies social conditions uh, so according to that document uh, social impact is an effect on the stakeholder uh, so on people that can affect uh, their well-being it arises from the behavior of companies involved in the product life cycle. And the social impacts are classified by stakeholder categories, impact categories, and subcategories. So here on, on that figure, uh, you can see the different uh, stakeholder categories um, that are listed in, sorry, um, in the guidelines. So you have the workers, uh, local community, society, consumers, uh, value chain actors, and all those stakeholders uh, can uh, be affected by um, the production of a product. And um, so in the subcategories, you have uh, different parameters, social parameters uh, that, that can that can be analyzed. For example, uh, uh, the forced labor, uh, child labor, uh, fair salary, uh, employment uh, relationship. Um, yeah, there are actually, um, I think, 59 uh, different uh, social indicators. So we conducted our study according to those guidelines, uh, which includes uh, four, uh, four steps. Uh, the first one is the definition of the goal and the scope. Uh, the second one is the social life cycle inventory, and then the social life cycle impact assessment. And finally, the interpretation of the results. So here in our case, we, we focus on the sectors manufacturing and remanufacturing chillers uh, in three case study countries that are relevant for, for, for the EU. Uh, so we chose China, Italy and Czechia. Uh, so China is the main importer uh, of chillers in Europe. Italy is the main producer um, of chiller in Europe and uh, Czechia is um, uh, one of the main uh, producer uh, of chiller in Europe, but also a country where uh, the labor costs are lower um, than in Italy, for example. Um, and uh, so we decided to focus on 28 social impact categories um, that we selected through a statistical analysis. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to detail that uh, too much here. Um, but it's important to know that we use the uh, input-output approach uh, for the social life cycle inventory. So uh, we use the PSILCA database. Uh, that is a, a very important database um, that was uh, created uh, in Germany several, ye several years ago. Um, the other type of approach uh, is the process approach, where did we describe uh, process uh, by process. Uh, but we, we decided to go for the input-output approach because it provides more detail uh, in the upstream um, um, supply chain. Um, we use the impact in, uh, assessment method provided in the PSILCA uh, database and guidelines. And we also use the structural path analysis to identify social hotspots. So uh, our, our main goal was to better understand uh, where uh, social risks were located in uh, those supply chain manufacturing and remanufacturing chillers. Uh, so this is an example um, of results that uh, we got. Um, hopefully this is uh, visible enough. But here you see uh, different uh, impact, social impact categories. Uh, so you find uh, fair salary, fatal accident, child labor, associate. So he and they are uh, uh, classified in uh, stakeholder categories as we saw earlier. Um, and then every point uh, represents the the value of impact in comparison to the median value for those three countries uh, that we studied. Uh, so China is in red, Italy is in uh, green, and uh, Czechia is in kind of a blue purple. Um, and what we can see from uh, that figure is that um, 
the Chinese manufacturing sector for Chile perform uh, uh, less uh, good, let's say, than uh, other uh, sectors, uh, other countries. So uh, just to help you understand, um, uh, the less uh, so values that are on the left hand side of the graph so uh, below the value of one are uh, very good values because it means that the social risk is low and then values that are on the right hand side of the graph uh, are the worst uh, worst performing uh, countries so we see uh, yeah we can identify then uh, potential risks for uh, uh, child labor, for example, uh, in China associated to manufacturing of chillers, but we also have uh, trafficking in person, association and bargaining, bargaining rights. Um, in comparison, in Czechia, we have uh, a social issue for gender wage gap, uh, men in sectoral labor force, uh, workers affected by natural disaster, uh, and in Italy, I think the main uh, social risk was about uh, migration. Um, And then we here is a, a figure representing the results of the structural path analysis. So the main intention here was to understand the structure uh, of the supply chain. So the different stages uh, um, uh, reflect the, um, uh, the different steps in uh, the manufacturing uh, uh, for the products, for example, um, stage four would be uh, a mining activity that, that, that would provide uh, the material for an industry to manufacture a piece that would then be sold to another uh, industry that would uh, assemble the product, etc. So we can see here how the, the association and bargaining right risk uh, is uh, distributed in the supply chain uh, in China. And we can see that uh, that social risk is kind of spread in different uh, um, in different uh, industries, uh, such as the other general industrial machine machinery, uh, wholesale and retail trade, steel processing. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, this kind of graph helps us to uh, identify social hotspots and then to make potentially a change in that supply chain. Uh, so yeah, we, we've reached uh, kind of the end of this presentation. So just um, some indication of what the project uh, aims to, to do. So it aims to bring practical solutions for MEP engineers to, to help them assess the technical feasibility and performance of reusing MEP products. Um, it, it also aims to contribute to the development of the theory in the field of circular economy uh, with some adaptation of ex existing concepts for architectural products uh, to MEP products. Uh, contribute to the policy objectives of Europe that want to stimulate the demand and offer for uh, reclaimed MEP products. And finally, to contribute to the reduction of uh, environmental impact in the construction sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, thank you, Sebastian. An excellent presentation. I have a question, and this is a common question, and I suspect you've been asked this previously. So what do you feel are the limits to this analysis? Um, yeah. That's a good question. So are, are you referring to the last uh, bit I, um, I was speaking about, uh, the social impact, um, I guess? I think all or the overall. Of, overall, oh. what do you identify as the limits to the study? And um, obviously, the second question would be, and what would be future research that you would recommend? Yeah. Uh, one very obvious limit is that we focused on five types, five types of building uh, services products or MEP products. Uh, and what we found out is that every product is very different. So, um, um, yeah, I, I think definitely we would need more uh, research uh, dedicated to each type of product. Um, that's kind of a obvious limit. Um, yeah. 
also we we would need uh, some testing for the tools that we are developing so uh, and probably more intensive testing uh, would be would be good to yeah to just uh, uh, further develop those methods that we're proposing. Um, also, more specifically about the last bit I presented, uh, input-output uh, approach, uh, of course, suffer from uh, a lot of um, uh, limitation. Uh, it's it's not perfect, so it's it's basically it's based on uh, economical uh, flows between different sectors. But we had to choose uh, a kind of generic sector manufacturing. Uh, uh, machinery uh, and not specifically chiller so what all, all we've investigated is the best we can do uh, but um, at the, uh, today but uh, I think in uh, in the future we would have uh, more specific uh, data and uh, that would help us uh, to better understand the social impacts um, so that's more for the last bit <laughs> Sebastian I have Quite a few questions here. Okay, I guess I see, we see that Simone has yeah. had her hand up as well for some time. So let's. First. So. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize the hand was too up. I I just meant to say that we were seeing the presenters slide, but that was it. But uh, thank you, Sebastian. That was a very interesting presentation, and um, since I now have the 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 I mean the chance to ask a question. <laughs> so I I was interested if you had any um if any part of your research addressed the economics or the the actual costs of introducing the reuse rather than replacing. Yeah. So, so that's uh, that's part of the the scope of the project, but um, it's still ongoing. So we have not, um, yeah, we have nothing at the moment to show, but uh, it's definitely part of the scope. And we we started uh, a little bit investigating this. Um, yeah, we found that, uh, for example, the the cost of dismantling uh, sometimes is higher than the cost of or the value of the product itself. Uh, that's typically the case for um, linear products uh, such as uh, ductwork or piping, where the cost of dismantling is uh, yeah much higher. So what we're hoping is that um, um, together with environmental and social consideration, we can uh, help to provide uh, a kind of a comprehensive approach of the impact of uh, reusing and help the decision uh, makers to, to take into account uh, not only one aspect, but, but you're right, cost is, is fundamental and um, yeah, it's coming. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. And I understand that it would be an important advice to policymakers, as in perhaps uh, lobbying for subsidies towards this kind of practice. Yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> We're we're also hoping by quantification uh, it will help people to better value the differences. Yeah. So right. that's why we focus on quantifying. Right. Thanks. I think we find in a number of linear product consumption, the price is lower because of the externalization of the environmental and social costs associated both with the extraction and production of the raw material. So I think that contribution, if you can help us incorporate those social, economic and environmental costs that are, that are now uh, excluded in the price of the product, then the price comparisons usually comes much closer. So we have a question here at, at our unit here. Hi, Sebastian. This is Mary Vernon. So uh, I actually have several, and, you, and Simone just touched on that, as did Dr. Lamore here. So my, my first question was actually around, um, what is your observation on getting a market or a region ready to transition to circularity? So taking into account that um, you know, the price in our in our society, typically we just weigh the price, right? <laughs> and so, 
Um, I guess to expand that, because you, you just touched on it a little bit, I would ask particularly on that um, on the social risk graph that you shared, as you find environmental data, are you able to take that and overlay it to see if they're to, to really make it clear to decision makers where the correlation is? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, the intention in in the end of the day is uh, is clearly to to provide uh, uh, all all the information uh, in a specific tool. So uh, engineers or decision makers uh, can use the tool, uh, make some uh, observation from the field, and uh, receive a kind of um, report that shows for that specific product. Uh, what would be uh, the social risks uh, of um, uh, the replacements uh, and the cost, etc. So uh, the intention is to, to yeah, gather all those information uh, and then to provide specific um, um, ideas. Of, and then for the market opportunity, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we have uh, at the moment actually in uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands uh, several companies uh, that are um, uh, making business out of uh, the reuse of uh, products, and um, they focus on uh, products that have a, a high value, uh, such as chiller. For example, if you compare the um, dismantling costs uh, to the the cost that people are ready to um, to invest in buying a reused chiller, uh, you have a quite uh, generous margin. So I would say to start in in the market, you you should look at uh, those products that have uh, the highest value uh, in comparison to the dismantling uh, costs. I would say that 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 would be a starting point. Yeah. <laughs> But I, okay. I, I know here in the US, uh, there is also in the electrical um, sector, uh, there is quite a few example of um, companies that are uh, making business out of uh, the reuse of uh, electrical systems. Uh, they also have, um, they gathered in a Perl, P-E-A-R-L, um, and they have created their own um, uh, standards for remanufacturing uh, electrical products. So th there is something happening uh, here, um, definitely. And I think that's a good good way forward uh, that those people um, that are that, that gather and uh, create standards. I, th I think that's a very good um, that's very good news. And also um, something very important I want to mention. Uh, is that the EPA uh, here in the US um, uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, they recognize reused products as uh, being low embodied carbon products. Uh, that means that there is a huge potential, uh, market potential for um, federal buildings to uh, purchase reused products um because they would they, they can claim uh, money from uh from EPA um for uh, to acquire those products so i i, I mean uh, i i think really the there is a huge potential market uh in the coming years so what one follow up on that <laughs> sorry um is when you i wasn't clear when you were speaking about the product um, and then measuring these these other indicators, were you, were you, are you looking at um, everything along an international supply chain, or are you looking just say at like parts at the um, uh, say at the manufacturing stage? Or I mean, are you taking are you sort of quantifying all along the way in each different country and then adding that up? Yeah, it's it's all along the way, and that's the the, the power of the input output approach. Um, so basically, it's a huge matrix with um, uh, in economic uh, exchanges between every sector uh, worldwide. So there are almost 15,000 sectors and every sector depends on each other. Uh, for example, the sector that manufactures chillers 
would depend on the sector that transports, uh, uh, for example, a, a component to the manufacturer. And that again will depend on another sector that manufactures the, uh, I don't know, the, the electrical cable to make the train works. And that one depends on another. So it, it takes everything into account. So every sector has a, a specific relationship with every other sector in the world. Um, so it, that's, yeah, it's a super powerful approach. Um, but of course, um, it depends on how, uh, how good the, um, uh, the sectors are made. For example, for the chillers, I had to use a more generic sector, uh, which is the manufacture uh, of machinery. Uh, it also includes uh, other products that I'm not directly interested in. Uh, but still, it's, I think it's a very powerful approach. And, and, and the, the main advantage is that it looks uh, in the whole supply chain and the dependencies are very, even the sectors you don't think about, they are included in the in that scope, yeah. And these are, that's all based on um, each country's methods of data cl collection and, and their self-reporting to the UN, is that correct? Um, yeah, so I, I'm using the EORA database um, that you can, uh, I can send you a link afterwards if you want. Uh, it's, um, it is created in Australia uh, and they, uh, they look into the, uh, yes, uh, I think statistical reports for each country. Um, and uh, actually each country reports, um, on the economics, uh, of those countries every year. So yeah, I, I can send you the link for, for more information. Um, Thank you so much. Excellent. Any other comments or questions? Sebastian, thank you so much for your presentation and the work that you're pioneering in this field of study. And I look forward to seeing your final results and hearing more of the work as you continue your professional career in this regard. Anything you would like to say before we sign off? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting. And uh, I always uh, liked speaking with you a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the opportunity.